We welcome in our uh, co-host from the first half hour, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, Senator Jason Barrett. Gentlemen, thank Good you morning. for hanging. It's our pleasure. Uh, our 835 Friday 5 crew, including Michael Carl. Mr. Carl. Good morning. Good to be with you. Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Great to be here. And returning via telephone, Joe, Joey Torts Ferretti, Mr. Ferretti. Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Are you happy about that or sad about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. Looking forward to it. Hey, I'm still here. <laughs> no show next Friday, by the way. No show all next week, in fact. Uh, the boss has uh, shut us down, giving everybody a week off. So uh, we'll be running best ofs next Friday. Mr. Barrett told me that should take about five minutes, but we're going to do our best to try yeah. to. <laughs> It'll be brief, that's for sure. <laughs> Joe, don't expect to hear your voice next week. <laughs> <laughs> And here we go, baby. Here we go. <laughs> Jason's, Jason's bringing it today. <laughs> I'm so glad you did that, Jason, because that actually plays into one of my interests. Today. Very nice. Uh, so, and then the week after that, uh, John Gilstrap will be the main host, as uh, I will actually be out uh, two weeks in a row. So I wasn't expecting the next week off, but I'll gladly take it. And uh, I'll be back again mid-July at some point along the way. So and until then, uh, we'll uh, do our uh, intros here. So... Without and further ado. Go a little something like this. Hit it. When last he was a Friday regular, in his favorite chair he sat and came on the show weekly as our token Democrat. But something happened that made him change his channel and cost him his slot on our weekly Friday panel. So why did Jason Barrett switch from donkey to elephant? Well, here's the untold truth, and I'm going to be blunt. Barrett lost at poker. The panelist Michael Caro, a hole he dug so deep, an amount he couldn't borrow. So Caro gave him a choice, if not cash, a party alteration. So Barrett made the switch and changed his registration. <laughs> What's most offensive about that is that the idea that I would lose poker to Michael. <laughs> there, I, if, if I could have written that down on the side as your response, it would have matched me word for word with how I nailed Larry's response a couple weeks ago. I haven't seen Mike Carl a lot lately at WRNR. Whenever I've been near, it seems that he's been far. There's been much I've wanted to talk to this guy about to get his opinion or see him look at Larry and shout. Even when Mike walked in today, I could see that he was distant. That frown on his face caused by what I knew in an instant. Yep, it's been a tough couple weeks since I last saw this guy's face. His favorite basketball team lost its coach, and the Cardinals are in last place. Sad times. Sad times. <laughs> the Supreme Court yesterday had some opinions that had this guy shaken, except for the decisions by Justices Sotomayor, Jackson, and Kagan. Old Larry Schultz looks at Clarence Thomas and see how he's flexed. First it was abortion, then affirmative action, and who knows what's next? These rogue conservatives ain't waffling or sitting on fences because Trump elections, Larry, have Trumpian consequences. Yeah, it's a, it's a terrible thing we'll have a chance to talk about here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible thing. I love this. <laughs> There's a lot of good reasons to have Joe Ferretti on the show today. His name ends in a vowel, and we both grew up the same way. Or how about because he's an attorney? I can get us some legal traction when it comes to describing decisions about things like affirmative action. But here's my favorite reason to have him on, the t on today's show, and I'm about to share it. My man knows how to poke the bear, and that bear today is Jason Barrett. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, you're, you're alluding to the, uh, the text yesterday, right? Well, I think it's just all-encompassing what's been going on this morning and yesterday's text. <laughs> now, many of you know Bill's car talks to him when he gets in the car each morning and says, Good morning, Admiral. How are you? You're looking great today, Admiral. That's why I bought the Tesla. But it's been a tough week for my co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. On Wednesday, his space was taken, so I had to park his Tesla in the field. For most of us, that would involve more time moving our car to the boat. But for Bill, it just meant speaking, go park yourself directly into his remote. Now, with that Tennessee accent, it's possible that his Tesla misunderstood, which would explain the car's reaction, and that reaction wasn't good. It seems the Tesla mistook the word park for another four-letter word and raised its hood and responded with the equivalent of shooting the Tesla bird. Bill said, now, Tesla, what's your problem? I'm not looking for a fight, as the Tesla beeped its horn and shined its high-beam light. 
Bill replied, Tesla, you're a great car, the best I've ever had. But the Tesla wasn't buying it and continued to be mad. Tesla honked its horn, and it seemed to be getting violent. But just as quickly, the mighty Tesla fell just as silent. Finally, the Admiral said, that's fine, Tesla. If you won't fall for flattery, just remember this lesson. Never mess with the man who knows how to disconnect your battery. <laughs> <laughs> you have real talent there, Rob. And someday, and I'll, someday I'll find out what it is. I was going to say, and someday we may see it. <laughs> <laughs> that day is not today, though. But you did like that better than your chat GP, uh, GPT. I intro. did, I did. I thought that was cute. Hey, uh, Joe, you are the leadoff hitter. Take it. I- I'm just always amazed by your voice inflection when you do the introduction. That, that seems to enhance... Uh, really, the, the cleverness behind uh, what you're saying, Rob. I, do you use that voice inflection in any other parts of your life? I mean, this is how you talk to your wife? Or... <laughs> Only when he's arrested. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the voice actually comes from a character I did back in 1991 when I was hosting the morning show on uh, – on another radio station, as they say, it was a uh, character I did who did uh, sports. So, okay. <laughs> Joe Tanuts. Well, his name. His name was Joe Tanuts, by the way. <laughs> Rob, we, uh, uh, of course, in the last segment talked a little bit about the uh, actions of the Supreme Court, and, it, and I wanted to focus uh, for my topic on the affirmative action case that was handed down yesterday. And in trying to read what the various justices wrote in their opinions, concurrences, and and, uh, dissents, uh, I've come to a central question here. And I'm I'm wondering, I I think this is something that we can debate till the cows come home, but I think it's an important discussion to have at this point in time now that uh, racial preferences, uh, affirmative action, if you will, is is no longer uh, going to be constitutionally sanctioned by the Supreme Court. We, I think we all can agree that diversity in our society, all aspects of society, not just the military and not just even in educational institutions, but at the workplace and, and people we associate with on uh, levels of friendship or uh, in certain civic and social organizations, religious organizations, diversity is, I think, valued by pretty much everyone in the society. It is something to strive to achieve. And when we have it, it it certainly serves us well. So if we accept that basic tenet of life, does simply refraining from discriminating uh, on the basis of race and and from granting uh, this this noble exercise of granting the same opportunities to all uh, people in society, will that still achieve the goals of racial or ethnic diversity going forward, will we still be able to say that uh, despite now what the current status of the law is, that, that what we have in place, both in terms of our collective mindset and our practices, will we still be able to achieve that racial and ethnic diversity that we desire? That's my question. I want to start first with Larry Schultz. Lawrence. Well, um, first of all, I, I'm constrained to point out that we is a rather big term for the group of people who desire that. There's a lot of people who don't desire that, period. It appears that Justice Roberts believes that affirmative action is okay for the bunker but not for the boardroom. Um, if you're going to risk your life fighting for the American way of life, then, okay, we'll use racial preferences to let you into the Naval Academy or the uh, the Air Force Academy or whatever. Uh, but all of a sudden, if you want to go to Harvard or Yale, it's going to be a different story. It's simply, uh, there are plenty of people, several of whom are on the Supreme Court, who do not want to see our society be more diverse, do not want to see people of various races um achieve at the highest levels and that's the reason for this the people who uh, they claim to be protecting by their inside out reading of the 14th amendment um don't need frankly the protection of the united states supreme court very much and um it's really a shame 
I wish, rather than lecturing us about how to achieve diversity in our society, they would go ahead and begin following their financial disclosure requirements and reporting these uh, lavish trips. Uh, I've raised that issue uh, with regard to Justice Alito. Uh, you know, Justice Roberts himself, his spouse is collecting money hand over fist from right wing groups. That's uh, they're not following their own rules. So, really, they what they're doing is winding themselves down to a fifteen percent approval rating from the American people, and it's going to uh, happen sooner rather than later, thereby achieving in courtrooms um, what the January 6th rioters tried to achieve in the Congress, an erosion of our national institutions. Mr. Carl. Well, I have a little difference spent on these issues. To me, uh, diversity is only uh, a way and an agenda to attack discrimination and that the goal in all cases should be achievement by based on merit, objective merit. And that should control all appointments, decision-making, and everything else is objective merit, not, you know, what race you are or, or aren't. And, and that, to, to me, that's, that's really what I and, – and, and, Joe, I want to act very much compliment you on your analysis of the – the ruling itself, but but that that is uh, to me what what this is all about is <clears throat> the 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 it, we we have decided that it's not affirmative uh, uh, diversity you know action is less necessary because discrimination which was the enemy has reduced but the discrimination must always be opposed regardless of you know, what the situation is. Bill. Yeah, uh, and I agree with Mike that uh, discrimination must be opposed. But then here where it becomes tough. How do you do that? Uh, merit, objective merit, again, uh, as Mike says, is something that's very commendable and something that should be based on, provided that everybody has an opportunity to display or achieve this merit. And unfortunately, in our schools, our uh, uh, especially early education, this is not the case. There are some that are put at an advantage over others. Uh, and there's some that's going to be late bl bloomers because of it. Uh, I... The uh, how we address affirmative action, I think, is in part of how we approach it individually. I found uh, we mentioned last time uh, Judge Thomas's uh, view was affirmative action was a stigma he carried the rest of his life. Uh, others view affirmative action as that vehicle to prepare themselves to mean a, uh, a constructive life. Uh, it comes back to like everything we do in life. It's uh, it depends on which side of the fence you're on, how you view it. It's either very good or very bad. There's very little in between. Uh, I do think that uh, the certain sectors of our community need consideration for them to reach their potential. Uh, and does affirmative action shut that door? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, or, the, or the Supreme Court decision hopefully does not shut that door. Uh, there, but there, and again, I'm not sure what latitude the schools have now. Uh, uh, the, the race cannot be the sole determinant, but hopefully it will be a consideration. Jason. Well, I think there's a very small minority of folks um, that Larry mentioned that don't want the best candidate for a university or, or an employment opportunity. I mean, are those folks out there? Yes. But that's not where – that's not what the majority of Americans believe. Americans believe that it should be a merit-based. Um, and, you know, you look at, at Clarence Thomas and his uh, concurring opinion – um, and you look at his situation where and he was admitted to Yale because of his race, and that means he he displaced someone. Someone had uh, the credentials, had the uh, academic achievement to get into Yale, and they didn't because uh, someone displaced them. Um, Joe mentioned uh, in the beginning uh, segment about not everyone starts at the same place in the 100-yard dash. Why do we make an assumption that one race – 
everyone in that one race starts at a different or, or starts behind. I mean, if we're really going to look at um, trying to have diversity from various backgrounds, why don't we look at, uh, you know, an individual applicant's um, uh, economic background or something like that as opposed to just doing this based on race? There was a uh, point made yesterday in some of the dissenting opinions that I read or comments or writings from, uh, you know, those who review Supreme Court decisions and write articles about it. And then Damon just mentioned it in a Facebook comment. And that had to do with how qualified students are routinely displaced because of legacy admissions. And this, of course, was not part of the lawsuit yesterday, but... I wonder, and I don't know the numbers on this, what number of people are displaced because of legacy admissions as opposed to or compared to affirmative action. And I don't know if universities admit publicly that they do legacy admissions. Obviously, if you have a 0, 0.0 uh, grade point average, you weren't getting into Yale regardless of what your father did or how much money he contributed. Uh, but by and large, legacy admissions, we are told, do exist. Mike, in the room, you're the only one who here went to Yale, so you can take well, a shot well, at it. Uh, I certainly wasn't there as a legacy. legacy right. <laughs> Correct. Um, neither of my parents had a degree from any college. But in being there with Clarence Thomas, it never occurred to me. And this is maybe just how you know naive and unsophisticated I was at that point in my life uh, that, that he that he 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 got some kind of a break. You know that he wasn't, that, or that he displaced someone who was more qualified. It never, ever, ever occurred to me, and I, you know, dealt with him, uh, you know, as a, uh, as an equal, and you know, and felt, uh, and 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 my, you know, feedback I got from him was that, you know, he 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 was deserved to be there and was qualified and uh, on the merits. So I'm just. Not a good person to, you know, to uh, opine on mm -hmm. on that that issue. Larry, legacy admissions, uh, Damon is correct, are another example of not trying to correct an injustice that was written into our constitution when we were founded and resulted in a civil war, but simply allowing uh, those with advantage and privilege. Uh, to continue that privilege into the next generation. And, of course, that's a very uh, thing, and it's very telling that our Supreme Court, uh, which sometimes has a problem filling out its financial disclosure forms, would leave that out as a comparison. The other one, of course, as everybody here is a big college football fan, there's an awful lot of admissions into universities of substandard students who can catch a football and who can tackle a runner. And there's an awful lot of that that goes on, probably not at, at Yale and certainly not in their law school, but all over the country, public universities paid for by taxpayer funds who give a preference to students who may not be the best student available who can play football or basketball or some other sport. If we're going to actually... Uh, recognize that this diversity is important, then um, we have to address all of these things. Otherwise, you are making it all about race. I don't know what the percentage of legacy admissions is to a school like, let's take an Ivy League school, for instance. I don't know what the percentage of admissions is because your parents were able to donate enough money. We learned from the whole Felicity Huffman, Lori Lachlan uh, scenario there out at USC and and uh, whatever else, whatever other schools were involved in that, that it takes an awful lot of money to curry a little bit of favor with the university uh, if your student is completely unqualified. It takes a very big donation, in some cases bigger than even those people were willing to make. So it, it does happen. Universities build buildings. It's what they do. But I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know how great those numbers are as compared to affirmative action admissions. I think I read yesterday, Joe, that uh, if they had re reduced or eliminated totally affirmative action admissions, Harvard's minority population would go from 20% to 16%, I think is what the, the numbers were. It doesn't seem like a, a great reduction in terms of admissions uh, for freshman class at those schools to me. 
a point that we're well, missing. Well, we, we, have, we have something to, to fall back on and to, to see what happens when you eliminate affirmative action, and that is the experience of the state of California, which by proposition, and I believe this was in the 1990s, they eliminated, uh, eliminated affirm, affirmative action in the California university system. Statistically, uh, the diversity of those universities decreased by 40% in the years following the elimination of affirmative action in California. Now, there has been a rebound since then because the universities, as they will nationwide after this decision yesterday, have found ways to work around just outright granting preferences to those based on race. Uh, California universities have, have made great strides in correcting the initial fallout from the elimination of affirmative action. I suspect that will happen with other universities, but it's clear that when you eliminate racial preferences, and let's understand what we're talking about here. And by and large, we're talking about applicants where their academic achievements, their involvement in extracurricular activities, all stack up to be fairly comparable. It's with those applicants where racial preferences then were, were granted to certain number of those applicants to get them into the school. It's not the case where we're admitting people to school who just don't belong there based on race. That's not happening. Uh, that would tend towards racial quotas, which has never been the law in this country. But where we have granted preferences is where students who present roughly equal applications in terms of all other aspects of their life, preferences were granted towards those who were in a minority community. Uh, so we have the experience of California to go back on. Interestingly, California, and I think this is important to understand when we talk about this decision, California has had opportunities to reinstate affirmative action in the California university system and have voted it down every time. So at least in that state, the public is not interested in going back to affirmative action. And I suspect there's a large swath of, of members of, of this country overall who probably feel the same way. Dylan Bishop and uh, our intern uh, Devin Stevens just sent me a text and said, an author named Evan Mandry has reported that 10 to 25% of admittance to elite colleges are legacy applicants. 21% at Notre Dame in 2020 were legacy applicants. 14% at Harvard in 2020 were legacy applicants. Make uh, of that what you will. And we begin with uh, issue number two. And for that, we go to the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. William, you're on the clock. Yeah, Rob, I'm, I'm going to shift gears somewhat. I'm uh, getting away from the very meaty discussion that we had with uh, the with Supreme Court to something that emerged this, during this past week. There was a trade delegation uh, from West Virginia that went to Seattle, Washington, to talk to Amazon and various others uh, to, uh, to promote the business attractiveness of West Virginia, and there are many. Now, let me be up front. I'm very much in favor of trade delegations. I think they serve a very useful function. This particular one, though, had 42 people, at least I come up with 42 people, when I head count the, the Photoshop. Uh, now, I've, uh, I was, uh, someone on the show yesterday, uh, Clay Riley, said there's only 30 people. Well, there had to have been 12 or 13 people photobomb the photograph that was published. Bonus points to the Admiral for the use of the term photobomb. Yeah, photobomb. Uh, so anyway, there was a, uh, uh, to me, there's a uh, large delegation there. Now, it had some very important people, people that should be there, uh, such as Craig Blair, uh, uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, probably uh, Mitch Carmichael, the president of Marshall University, president of Western University. All these folks are very legitimate. But there were 40, there were probably uh, uh, 25 or 30 people in addition to that. There they may well have been justified, uh, but they was never promoted in the argument or mentioned in the argument what role these various people played. Uh, in a very recent history, we've had a, a, some examples where unnecessary travel came back to bite the participants. One was Supreme Court justice a couple of years ago. Uh, lost his job because of some of his travel. More recently, Upshur County uh, that's under uh, uh, 
serious review right now from the legal perspective. A lot of that was unjustified uh, travel. So I guess my question is, and I'm not saying this was not unjustified, but it is not documented, so it's hard to tell. And I'm assuming all the money was uh, all the travel expenses came out of the taxpayers' uh, pockets. Uh, this is generally the case. Uh, now, possibly Amazon paid for people to come, but I doubt that. I think it came from uh, the taxpayer dollars. My question is, where does it go? Where is the line from legitimate business pursuits with a, uh, with a legitimate uh, uh, delegation to a travel boondoggle? Let me start with Jason. Senator Barrett was not part of that delegation uh, which went, but he does know these people, and he knows generally how these are funded. Jason, any insight on that? Well, as I looked at the picture of 42 people, I don't think there are 12 people that photobombed. I think there are 12 employees of Amazon in that picture, uh, and that's the reality. Um, as I look through that, I, I recognize uh, just about all 30. There's probably five or six people I don't recognize and, and that are not of that 12. And I, I've been I've shown who the 12 are that are Amazon employees. There are probably five above that that I don't recognize. Um, and I assume them to be uh, either in the Economic Development Office. Uh, Mitch Carmichael is there. Clearly, I recognize him. It could be some of his staff I don't, rec I don't recognize. It could also be... Um, folks traveling with WVU and Marshall. Uh, certainly both presidents are there, uh, Gordon Gee and, and Brad Smith. They're both there. As I look at the, the legislative uh, members there, off the top of my head, I think there are about five from each house, or five from the House, five from the Senate. Uh, I recognized three staff members of the legislature there. Uh, and then I think the rest of the folks are either uh, in the uh, executive branch are, or in the uh, with the, one of the universities. Now, I, I, Bill, I'm not sure if you were comparing this trip to what Alan Lawfrey did as uh, a member of the Supreme Court who flew out to a conference in California, skipped the conference, uh, rented a vehicle, and toured wineries all day. I, I, I don't think that's a fair comparison to what this is. And um, it's my understanding, and I, I haven't – I've gone on uh, – trips with the legislature in the past to study different things. Um, I don't recall ever getting any type of salary, any type of per diem. Typically, the uh, travel expenses covered uh, through the hotel or, or uh, as well as the air, airfare. There, there's no per diem. There's no salary for us. There, there's none of that. Um, I don't know what the overall cost of this is. I'm sure WVU and Marshall have paid their way to go there. Uh, I don't think this is a large expense uh, to the taxpayers, uh, but uh, I, I do think that you look at the companies that have located to West Virginia in the past four or five years, uh, a lot of that has come from work from uh, the development office, from economic development, uh, through legislative trips like this. I think there is a huge return on the investment, but I think it's also uh, incredibly important to understand that you know there aren't 42 people from West Virginia in this picture. Um, and so did the article do uh, a good job of explaining who's there and who's not? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know that, that they expected uh, people to just make this assumption that everyone posing in this picture with the state flag of West Virginia uh, to be there at the taxpayer expense. Okay, Bill, does that help? Uh, well, it does, and obviously Jason has much better insight than I do, and I know someone on the uh, uh, the chat room said that Blair said zero tax dollars were involved on the trip. Uh, if that's true, uh, great. I, uh, uh, but I, I also uh, agree with the point that you made, Jason, that the article, the write-up of the article, left us hanging, and there was a lot of unknowns. And I, I think more, more time you have an uncertainty, the more confusion, the more objection you can have to something that is obviously on the core is very, very valuable. Larry, well, that that last point you make about zero tax dollars doesn't end the analysis because if the taxpayers didn't pay for it we shouldn't automatically assume that mr blair went into his own pocket and paid for it himself and there's a third possibility that um amazon paid for it and now we now we need to know about that look i mean i'm not accusing anybody of anything but it doesn't help me very much to say no tax dollars were spent. 
And the reason it doesn't help me is because I don't necessarily want to see my elected officials taking free trips from Amazon or anybody else. Uh, there ought to be a way, you know, they have this thing called Zoom now where you can talk to one another without getting on an airplane. Uh, you know, there may be uh, ways of doing this without whining and dining people at either taxpayer's expense or uh, from the pockets of major corporations that are looking to influence um, policymakers in particular states so they can get advantages when they move their company uh, to the state. All of that, I'm not accusing anybody. I'm saying all of it should not be, well, I don't even know who paid for it. We should all know who paid for every trip that a state employee takes and what the purpose is. It's not that tough to be transparent. And when you're not transparent, as the United States Supreme Court is finding out, when you're not transparent, it causes people to assume, uh-oh, what you know, what's going on here? Um, you know... When, when there are rules about transparency, I don't know that there are any in particular, maybe we need some, but it would just be better if everyone was able to understand what the source of the funds were and what happened on the trip. Mike Carl. Well, <clears throat> I, I appreciate Jason's uh, explanation, although I don't, it, it stuns me, Admiral. Uh, that 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 you see this as a, a great uh, potential, you know, scandal, government waste, and or, or Larry, of, you know, of bribery and corruption. If <clears throat> if if these facts in this circumstance that we, you know, now we know more about, thanks to Jason, uh, were the worst thing we faced, then we're we're living in heaven. The, uh, in terms of, of, of government waste and corruption. It, 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 it's nothing <clears throat> compared to, to what we've worried about in the past, and therefore uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable when I was before the issue was raised. Joe Ferretti. <clears throat> well, I, I, I agree, Mike. We're, we're a long ways off from, from – having a governor with hundreds of thousands of dollars stuffed into his desk um, 30 years ago. but uh, we, we wish this one did so he could pay his tax bills, though. <laughs> oh, he probably does, but he isn't going to use that for his tax. <laughs> but here's, here's uh, I, my initial reaction when I read Bill's uh, topics last night was, and Larry's right, you know, in, in, in this day and age, you know, business travel has been cut way back because of platforms like Zoom and Skype and, and things of that nature, Teams. Uh, and, and so while it might be critical for somebody like a Mitch Carmichael or uh, the president of the Senate, uh, Craig Blair, to be there shaking hands and, and having face-to-face -face discussions with Amazon, if I'm the vice chair of finance, uh, do I need to be there? I mean, does Amazon need to hear from 30 voices instead of one or two that represent West Virginia? Can I not just listen in or appear by Zoom and be introduced and say, I'm the vice chair of finance, and, uh, yeah, I have an interest in whatever it is Amazon is thinking about with West Virginia, so, you know, educate me. Uh, I, that, that was my first reaction. But my second reaction is to the statement by Craig Blair that no tax dollars were involved. Is that possible, Jason? that every one of these participants on this trip self-funded in terms of their airline tickets, hotels, meals, uh, it, it, is that the way it works? I, I don't know. I'm mean, not on this trip. I, I don't know how this particular trip works. I, I don't know that, you know, for him to say that there's no taxpayer dollars, I don't think that that's an assumption that every legislator paid their own way. I, I, I don't know that. Um, I would anticipate about $1,000 for three nights of a hotel and airfare uh, from uh, CRW in Charleston to uh, to the uh, to Seattle, uh, so I, I don't know that 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 is the case. Um, I have looked through the picture, and again, neither vice chair of finance in the Senate or the House are there. Um, but I I think I don't think that you can appreciate uh, what Boeing does, what Microsoft does, what Amazon does. Um, uh, through Zoom. I mean, there's a reason you guys um, don't talk to a jury through Skype, that you actually have court 
trial in a courtroom. Uh, and I think that um, having Zoom or Skype uh, on a tour through Boeing uh, probably isn't appropriate, and you probably don't get much out of that. Jason, that's a great point, and I was about to make the same point, so I'm not surprised you and I were in a mind meld on that one because I was about word for word there with you on that one, and that is some people work a room better than others for whatever reason, reasons that we cannot teach or calculate or diagram. Some people are charismatic in front of other people, and they have a way of communicating in person that doesn't translate over a telephone line or over some type of video conference. It's the reason why some people are better salespeople than others. Some people are better closers than others. Some people are better attorneys than others because they have a better uh, way of communicating with people. Some people are better at this than I am. It's a long list, Jason. Well, but that, but that we, we, we can't teach some things that are just intrinsic to people that are able to be communicated person to person, not over video. Yeah. Now, Couple of points. One, Rick Manning uh, clarified. Craig Blair was talking about the trip to Taiwan and not the trip to Seattle. So we do not know if any tax dollars involved at all. But the other thing is, and again, I did not object. I am not objecting uh, to a trade delegation mm -hmm. uh, when you, as it's very important to have face to face. Your question was the number. My question is a number, and I spent a lot of years in the federal government. We rarely, rarely took more than three people at any particular place. And if we went more than three, we had to have a good justification. I'm, I'm shocked, literally, by the number. And Jason may well be right uh, that, there, uh, that there were a lot of uh, Amazon folks in the picture. I don't know. I don't know. But if there's, say, let's say 25 people, 30 people, were they all necessary? And I think a hotel room in Seattle is, uh, is more expensive than a... a Certainly they are well, typically here. the government rate is given to, to legislators. So True. Um, and, and I think what you also have to understand is that the, the purpose of these trips is to uh, tell West Virginia's story, to yes. attract business here. You're, we are in competition with so many other states. And do you think these companies are, are going to uh, give uh, – uh, you, you think it, it, it scores more points to go see them in person or to have a Zoom? I mean, if, if somebody comes out and meets with me and, and is serious about having uh, an environment in their state where I can attract my business and they come out and talk to me in person, am I more apt to give uh, them the time of day and give them serious consideration or – Ten people that got on a Zoom meeting and were distracted the entire time by something else they were doing. Jason, you're missing my point entirely. My point is not the fact face-to-face. -face. My point are the number of people. All right, let's I wasn't necessarily directing it to you. Other, people's made, other people on this panel made that, that point. Close down well, issue. That's a, corruption of, that's a corruption of my point. I, I indicated that there were essential people that needed to be there in person. I don't know that 30 people need to be there representing West Virginia. Yeah. All right, let's move on to issue number three, and for that we go to Senator Jason Barrett. Um, I watched uh, a little bit of the uh, town hall meeting uh, and interview, the national televised town hall meeting uh, with RFK Jr., and I couldn't help but think about his uncle's uh, campaign, in the Ted Kennedy's campaign in 1980 when he challenged uh, then-President Jimmy Carter. And so my question to the panel is, do you think RFK Jr. has a, any legitimate shot uh, to be the Democratic nominee for president, and how would you compare his run in 2024 to his uncle's uh, campaign in 1980? Going back to you, Bill Stubblefield. The short answer is no. I do not think he has a chance. And the comparison that uh, uh, his, uh, his uncle ran a very positive campaign, I'm going to make America great. Uh, the, uh, the nephew is doing just the opposite. He's running a very negative campaign. Mike Carl. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I hope he succeeds, of course. <laughs> but but I, 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 think he's, I think he's got a shot, not because he's doing so well, you know, in, in, in his uh, campaign effort, but because of Biden is failing so much, and and I I, I think it it I, I don't know it'll go as far as you know as, as uh, the earlier uh, Kennedy effort did, but it it might, and, and I I I, I think it, and mostly because of how much Biden is declining in uh, effectiveness and perception of effectiveness. Biden's poll numbers are low, but Larry Schultz says that's not the whole story. Well, no. RFK's in the wrong party. He's a conspiracy theory loon. The other problem with RFK, 
is unlike anybody else I ever heard of who ran for president. Uh, he was arrested and convicted for possession of heroin in the 80s. I, I don't think you make yourself uh, by a uh, legacy in that way uh, into a non-criminal or into a non-loon. Uh, it, it's a little late, I think. RFK, I mean, I was a little kid when JFK was president. I'm 65 years old now. There's an awful lot of voters out there who are going to need more than RFK to even know who this guy is. And once they learn who he is, I don't think he's going to be around for long. I mean, he's got enough money to hang around for as long as he wants, but I don't see a Ross Perot type uh, move here or a, um, or a Ted Kennedy type move. Ted Kennedy, for all his faults, was a very successful United States senator and legislator. Pretty hard to find anything that RFK Jr. has done that would ma- would match it and make him uh, that kind of powerful figure. Joe Ferretti. Uh, the answer to Jason's question is no. Uh, a recent Quinnipiac poll has amongst Democrats now, so I don't want my car to go crazy here, but amongst Democrats, likely primary voters, President Biden has an 84% approval rating. Now, there's... <laughs> Look, I'll be the first to admit, a lot of Democrats have some misgivings about President Biden uh, running for re-election. There's no question about that. But his approval ratings among those who are going to be voting in these primaries is very high, which means RFK Jr. has no shot. And when he becomes more vetted as the primary season rolls around, and let's not forget Marianne Williamson has got her name in in the mix, too. Uh, I think you'll find that some of his positions are not only going to be uh, criticized, but derided by likely Democratic voters because RFK Jr. is out there, uh, you know, to the point where Sirhan Sirhan didn't kill his father, uh, despite admissions by Sirhan Sirhan that he did it, Uh, and despite videotape pretty much showing it. it. It's you know, he, he's got some positions that are really hard to, to defend or justify, and I think that will ultimately be his undoing. But the simple fact is President Biden is still popular amongst Democrats, and that's going to be the end of the story. Comes back to you, Jason. I, I don't think that RFK Jr. has a legitimate shot either. I do think he has uh, all the potential uh, to make things incredibly difficult uh, for Joe Biden um, during the process. Uh, keep in mind, in West Virginia, uh, Keith Judd, who was in prison at, at, and probably still is in Texas, received 40 percent of the Democratic vote in West Virginia against Barack Obama. Uh, don't be surprised if you see numbers like that in West Virginia and, and some other more conservative states. Uh, I, if there's a debate between Joe Biden and RFK Jr., uh, Joe Biden can only lose that. Uh, I, I think that you've Joe Biden has been a gaffe machine for 50 years, uh, but here more recently, uh, it's almost painful to watch, uh, and and I, I think if you see him on a debate stage against RFK Jr. or or someone in, uh, in during the general election, uh, that, that that could be bad news for that campaign. I don't. Well, Jimmy, why but, why would uh, uh, Biden even debate uh, Robert Kennedy Jr.? Well, I, I th- it depends on poll numbers. Uh, I, I mean, it's going to if you're the if you're the favorite in. in you have nothing to gain, certainly you don't do it. Yeah. But it doesn't, you know, it, it's not going to uh, give any credibility to his uh, cognitive ability uh, if he's declining debates. Um, you know, we don't have a pandemic. He's not going to be able to hide in the basement during this presidential campaign. Uh, yeah, but the RFK Jr. poll numbers have not changed at all since he first announced, around 20%, and it stayed static at 20%. Yeah, and we have several months, uh, You're eight right. or nine months mm-hmm. before Iowa, so... All right. On that note, we take a halftime break here in the 9 o'clock hour. And Larry Schultz, you are on the clock. Up next on the break here as we move on to issue number four. And for that, we go to attorney at law, Larry Schultz. Yes. um, My question um, sort of follows on something we were just talking about a little bit. Um, How has the president described by Trumpers as demented and senile managed in just two years to create more jobs than the last three Republican presidents did in their entire terms. Um, is it something that uh, um, 
This seems like an antagonistic question to me, it, it, uh, Larry. Well, there's no question that it is. <laughs> but they didn't say back then that George W. Bush was senile. He was quite a young man then. He only created 2 million jobs in eight years. Um, and whatever he did create, he lost most of them just before he left office. Um so I want to know, how is Joe Biden doing this if he's such a gaffe machine? Let me go to Joe Biden's biggest defender, Mike Carl. Mike? <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's a typical plaintiff's attorney uh, distortion of the truth and the facts. The, the, you're, 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 you're compa- Get that, Joe? <laughs> uh, you're comparing the number of jobs, you know, from uh, an early – we we had a huge response uh, uh, recovery going from uh, while Trump was still president from 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 you know from from the pandemic, but that is absolutely not true. It's playing games with selective, corruptly selected dates, and it's not true. And if if you if you think any. Uh, person that knows anything about uh, uh, the, the economic uh, history of, of uh, particularly the recent economic history of America, and you think that Joe Biden is the greatest uh, private job creator uh, that we've had, uh, it, it's absurd. Joe Ferretti. Well, Mike, um, uh, setting aside that shot at plaintiff's attorneys, uh, <laughs> I I, the statistics are hard to deny uh, about job creation, but I, I will concede the point you make that the pandemic has certainly skewed the numbers. There's no doubt because we basically shut down the economy and then we, you know, we, we restarted it. And yeah, there's a lot of job creation because businesses are coming back online and, and there's a lot of hiring going on. But I have my point is this in the face of interest rates that are the highest we've seen in a decade, where it's clear that the Fed wants to put the brakes on the economy, help with this problem with inflation, and really create unemployment to a certain degree. They have been unsuccessful in doing so because of the strength of the economy today. We are still hovering at historic lows in terms of unemployment. Even in the black community now, we are seeing statistics that we have not seen before in terms of their participation in the labor market. Uh, So to me, uh, it's hard to deny that under this current president, this economy has shown remarkable resiliency despite an effort by the Fed to slow this economy significantly. And so he has to have some credit for that. Let, let me good, good, re- respond quickly. Uh, it is in spite of Biden and the liberal Democratic agenda that the great American free enterprise system has responded as well as it has. And, and, and anybody that misses that relationship uh, just doesn't understand. Trump told us the pandemic would be over in 15 days, and he, during his term, lost three million american jobs three million that was his job creation well the the the, minus three we we had a pandemic and disaster and his his class typical uh you uh you know uh overstating selling stuff you know nobody believes that you know 15 days or nobody believed it then but but uh it was terrible leadership but but before Biden became president, the job recovery was coming back. Jason Barrett. Um, I think that the job gains, and there are reports out there that indicate 72% of the job gains uh, from since 2021 were a direct result of the recovery from the pandemic. Uh, if you look at workforce participation under Joe Biden, it's actually, it's actually 0.7% lower under Joe Biden than the previous administration. I think you can also make the case that uh, with – uh, high inflation that the wages that employees are making right now is not keeping up with that inflation uh, combined with uh, high interest rates that Joe talked about. I, I think that a lot of Americans are seeing less cash in their pockets right now uh, than they have in the past. Billy. 
anticipating this discussion, I went did some research last night on the internet, and I was looking at the uh, the Ronald Reagan, which is the standard bearer for a lot of the Republicans, and Joe Biden, and these are average figures. Keep in mind that uh, Ronald Reagan eight years, Joe Biden only two years. Uh, gross uh, GDP growth, Reagan two point one percent, Biden two point six percent, inflation rate. Uh, Reagan, 4.7, Biden, 5%, poverty rate, uh, about the same, real disposable income under Reagan, uh, 27,000, real disposable income under Biden, 46,000, unemployment is uh, 3.5 under Biden, 5.4 under Ronald Reagan. The point is, and keep in mind that no one president can be fully responsible or held accountable for what happens during his tenure. But I don't think you can dismiss Biden's economy, Biden's success, casually in saying he's doing a horrible job. The numbers do not support that. Well, I think you can't go back 40 years and compare numbers right. from the I, 80s to I, today. I was not expecting the question framed. I thought it was going to be framed in terms of Ronald Reagan. Reagan. I, I, <laughs> and I don't blame you for expecting that from Mike. Right. Well, well, that, was, that, that was inflation adjusted? Comparisons? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. No, I have inflation adjusted, but unfortunately, my computer cut, cut it off, oh, so I don't. Okay. I don't have the. But so, uh, so forty-seven thousand today compared to twenty-eight thousand, yeah. you know, thirty years ago. Five percent unemployment in the eighties, coming out of the seventies, was a tremendous improvement. Yes. at that time. Yes. Five uh, percent so unemployment now, and we're all jumping out of buildings talking about how horrible the economy is. Five percent unemployment in the eighties got you reelected by a landslide out of forty-nine out of fifty states. I was not saying one doing abysmal, one doing great. I'm just saying that there are numbers right. that would it, but support. You, but numbers, numbers don't exist in a vacuum. The, the numbers that are presented, whether it's Biden's numbers or Reagan's numbers or whomever's numbers. You have to look at the previous administration and the previous economic times as well because the numbers are relative to the time that you're existing in. Uh, but you know, we, can, we can look at, uh, I think Joe's point is a great one, that no matter how hard the Fed tries to slow things down right now, they're, they're really struggling to try to slow inflation and get it back down to 2%. The economy is just that strong. Jason's point is a good one as well. Biden is creating a lot of jobs, but we did lay off a lot of people during the – the pandemic. So there are going to be more jobs to restore and to create. So again, you can't just can't look at the numbers in a vacuum here. Back to you, Larry. Um, I, I would just say that it's remarkable to me that we did not hear from some of these lesser performing presidents this kind of nasty, personal, uh, cheap shots about him being senile and demented. Um, I guess we heard a little bit of it toward the end of the Reagan term. Uh, but this is what they have now. This is what they have. They can't argue the numbers because the numbers are at best every bit as good as the numbers of any Republican president in our lifetime. So, um, you know, they have to do something, and this is what we get. Uh, Joe Biden has always been a person who will stumble over his words, start laughing, and say something else. That doesn't bother me a bit. I know lots of people like that. I think it makes him uh, more approachable uh, and more, um, in some ways, liked by average Americans who don't see themselves as masters of the perfect uh, phrase. Uh, I don't think that that thing about Biden that they say all the time uh, is ever going to uh, stop Joe Biden from succeeding. Well, I think if the market continues to recover, oil prices don't spike, and inflation continues to reduce, it's going to be very difficult to beat Joe Biden in the next election. I think if you look at Joe Biden during the 2008 presidential campaign, that's the Joe Biden you're talking about, the one that's the gaffe machine that says off-the-wall things at times. What you're seeing now is him not knowing how to get off of a stage, him getting up in the, just as an interview is completed when the, the TV cameras are still on uh, and they haven't gone to commercial break and he just gets up and walks off. Those are the types of things that, that I think people are, are seeing and that, that he doesn't have the wherewithal or the, the, the awareness that, of what's going on around him that is very different from the Joe Biden you're talking about from the 2008 presidential campaign. The best I can tell you is he's succeeding in a very difficult job, in a very difficult time, in a way that 
all the heroes of the Republican Party did not succeed. He he also succeeded in what is going to be proven as being the, being the most corrupt national leader we've ever had. <laughs> when, 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 when the Hunter Biden laptop issue oh my finally materializes. That, that's saying a lot considering that uh, Hillary was in the White House for a Yeah, while. I, I, even Hillary, you know. <laughs> right. Compared to, yeah. Well, well he, he, considering he, the guy she, you she, voted for. She's far more sophisticated than yeah. that. Yeah. He, he, he just was the big guy that you know, we don't talk about. Uh, they're going to, I mean, I don't care how good, you know, the economy is. I mean, his relationship to that is, you know, I would say non-existent. But but, his, but the average voter attaches yeah, the economy to the president. Yeah, and, 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 and that's why his numbers generally, you know, are down because they, they're not feeling the inflation is, is hurting <clears> them and they and, – but but the the thing the thing that's really going to matter is when they confirm and prove his connection and his bribery from uh, China and Ukraine. And on that note, Mike, we stay with you to go to issue number five. Okay, I'm speaking of, um, we'll step back down to the state level, and I I raise this question: Who will Donald Trump support for the Senate race in West Virginia, Justice or Mooney? And the question be who he thinks, you know, will help him, you know, politically or who will contribute the most money to his campaign. And you think about the the uh, financial comings and goings of, of those two candidates and, you know, mm -hmm. I'll leave it open to somebody to answer the question. Will, 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 will Trump support? Uh, support Justice or Mooney. All right, and, and why? Bill Stubblefield. Well, I think both uh, Trump and Mooney, uh, excuse me, uh, Justice and Mooney are going to go full court press trying to get Trump support. I doubt, though, if Trump's going to support either one of them. There is no real reason for him to. He does not need West Virginia's vote to win the primary. He's going to win, get West Virginia's vote by a landslide. Uh, so there is no reason for Trump to jump in the middle of the of the uh, the senatorial race uh, primary, so I don't I think he's going to be absent altogether. And uh, that reminds me, by the way, we have promoted the fact that Alex Mooney was going to be on the show today, but uh, he was not able to make it. His uh, person sent me a text about it, and it said, "I'll read it to you." As it says, uh, "Leadership asked Representative Mooney to preside over the pro forma session of the House today. Feel free to let listeners know they can tune into C-SPAN at two o'clock today to watch the representative preside over the House." That's what shook up the entire schedule today. So because of that, uh, two o'clock appointment. We don't. We weren't able to get him at eight uh, this morning. Larry Schultz. Um, uh, now we uh, uh, have crossed over a couple of lines, but um, it, I believe Bill is correct. If you jump onto one side of that uh, thing and you support justice, then the Mooney people are going to say, "Well, come on, man." What are you doing to me? And the same the other way. It's bound to be a fairly close race, and there's no point in Trump splitting it. Now, that being said, that's the logical, reasonable thing to do. Uh, we are talking about Donald Trump, and if you catch him at the right moment, he'll say things that will eventually get him put in prison. We've seen this recently. <laughs> and so it's not necessarily true that what we see as the logical thing to not do is something that he won't do. Um, so I can't say for sure, but at that point, it's random as to which one of them he would represent, he would uh, endorse. Joe Ferretti. So I was the fill-in for Congressman Mooney this morning? <laughs> yes, Joe, you were the fill-in for Congressman Mooney. He did a great job. Okay. You Just were just okay. equal constitutional <laughs> scholars. <laughs> you were amazing. <laughs> What an ins what a, what an insult to Joe. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to hope that uh, I will hope and pray that people learned a little bit more with with me than than they might have otherwise. But uh, that's beside the point. Alex's mother um, listens to this show. Be kind. I know I know she does, and my apologies. Um, look, I, I don't think to answer Bill's. Uh, answer, I'm sorry, Mike's question. I don't think that uh, Trump's going to jump in this race. Uh, I mean, you could travel down through Hardy and Grant County today and still see signs that 
uh, Congressman Mooney placed in people's yards a picture of him beside President Trump uh, from the last election. And I'm sure by purpose those are going to stay up, uh, even though he might not get a, a, a full-throated endorsement from the former president. Uh, I just don't think Trump's going to jump in because uh, uh, reportedly – uh, his son, Donald Trump Jr., uh, has uh, a good relationship with the governor. They've gone hunting together. Uh, you know, they've been in constant contact with each other. It's Governor Justice's way to stay in touch with the Trump family. So there's a relationship there, too. And I, I don't see uh, the ex-president endorsing either one of these fellows. Now, once the primary is over, you know, look out. But uh, I, I just think there's too many ties between uh, both candidates, and this is probably one Trump will set out. JB? Well, I, I'm, like everyone else, I think as of right now, Donald Trump probably stays out of the race. Um, I, I think that, that both of them have been incredibly supportive of Donald Trump in the past. Uh, I, I believe that Donald Trump has uh, endorsed both of them in the past, and I would anticipate both of those candidates uh, to use – uh, older uh, clips or or endorsements or, or uh, kind words uh, in their campaign material uh, in in this primary, but you know I think Donald Trump has has made a lot of endorsements across the country, but it's typically uh, uh, for a, a you know a a Trump uh, candidate uh, that, that that supports him against someone that's more of an anti-Trumper. So when you have two folks that are uh, been supportive of, uh, of Donald Trump, I don't see him really making an endorsement unless uh, towards the end of this campaign, if one pulls uh, so far ahead in the polls that there's going to be a clear winner, then I can see him uh, making an endorsement. Goes back to you, Michael. Uh, I, I agree generally with everything that's been said that, that if Trump has any sense, he'll he'll, he'll avoid uh, making a choice. But if he if Joe Manchin announces that he's running for reelection to his office, I think Trump may be so compelled to beat uh, uh, Manchin, you know, in, in the general election that he will care about and want to you know support the most the strongest candidate mm -hmm. against Manchin. okay so that wraps up issue number five i want to circle back to bill's issue about the trip to the west coast to visit with amazon and the large contingent of folks who went out there uh earlier this week i texted house majority leader eric householder and asked if he knew how the trip to amazon was funded he said the legislative control accounts in the budget. So, Jason, this brings us to you so you can explain to us what that means. Uh, there are accounts uh, that set up in the budget that, that, uh, that go to the legislature. So there's a line item uh, for the House of Delegates in the budget. There's a line item in the, in the budget for the state Senate uh, to use for uh, whether it be operations uh, within the building, uh, whether it, it be trips like this or, or other things. There's, there's also line items in there uh, for grants that individual legislators uh, can can spend money in their districts for uh, some charitable organization that you know, that has some matching funds that just needs a little bit of money to get over the finish line. So th there are monies built into the budget for these type of things. Uh, but again, the state senate and the house of delegates have line items in the budget for operating expense and these type of things. All right. So that brings us back to the fact that it was taxpayer funded bill. So knowing now how it was funded, how do you feel about the trip? I've been consistent with how I feel. I think it's very justified. The trip was necessary. Having folks like Craig Blair, Eric Householder, uh, uh, Roger Henshaw, and the, and the two presidents of the universities, I think that's very, very legitimate. So I support that. That's the way we bring business and bring exposure to the to the state. I still come back, and and every person in that delegation may be justified, but we don't know. We don't know, and we are sensitive. We hear it all the time. Protect the taxpayers' dollars. Protect the taxpayers' dollars. And here, there is an open question mark in my mind: Was taxpayers' dollars been supported by having a large delegation, whether it's 30 or 42 people, uh, whatever, having a large delegation to go, when a critical number, smaller number, was necessary? 
was the large number there? That's my question. Jason, is the, are these funds only available to the elected members of the a delegation that went out there? Well, I mean, it would be paid. The staff members, you know, their trips would be paid as well. Uh, so it's it's the House of Delegates, the State Senate. I, I didn't and hear, their staff members. Right, right. And there are. I saw three staff members in the picture, but I don't know that I heard from the text from Eric Householder about the folks from WVU and Marshall. Uh, how that was paid. Now, I would assume that the that the universities paid their way to get some of their folks there, and I recognize several people from both universities in that picture. If I if I can going back to my experience as a federal government, if they were if it was a federal government delegation, you would invite other folks to uh, to participate on the federal budget's dollars. So I think probably uh, all this was supported by. Uh, within the two line items of the Senate and the House. Well, that's a big assumption that I Well, I it, it is, uh, but I'm going to stick by that until you have evidence to the contrary. Joe Ferretti, any thoughts? Yeah, I, well, <laughs> despite a $45 million deficit uh, this year, it wouldn't surprise me if E. Gordon Gee had a large contingency of West, uh, contingent of, of WVU people following him out there because. Uh, uh, he seems to be a bit of a spendthrift, but uh, uh, I, yeah, I, I think you know, it's, it's, it's taxpayer dollars involved. Uh, I think it's right to question the, the size of the uh, group that went out there to represent West Virginia. I, I, my question is, why did I mean Seattle has a great fish market? I'm just surprised Jason Barrett didn't go along. <laughs> he Jason, wasn't asked. Jason's busy. <laughs> Jason's busy. The Supreme Court will rule late. Well, well they'll, I guess they'll uh, publish their ruling in regards to the uh, Joe Biden attempt at student loan forgiveness. Let's go around the room and get a quick prediction as to how you think that's going to go. I'll start with you, Mike Carl. It'll be ruled unconstitutional. Uh, numbers? Nine, oh, oh, nine uh, vote split. What is it? Uh, six three. Larry Schultz. I would agree. They're going to. They're going to do it. Why would they change now? And numbers. Um, yeah, six to three. We'll stay on the attorney theme here, Joe, and go with you too. Your thoughts? Yeah, it, it's going to be seen as an overreach of executive power when it involves the uh, United States Treasury, and, and I see a six-three vote off. Bill Stubblefield, six-three as well, and Jason Barrett. It's unanimous. Everyone going six-three. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. All right, you did say unanimous. Uh, that, uh, the truth of that is a, in, in, inarguable, given. It's unanimous, including the plaintiffs and plaintiffs' oh, lawyers oh, together. Oh, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> we started the phone with Joe Ferretti. Eight seconds. Joe, go. No surprise that the interim coach at the WVU basketball was hired by Gordon Gee. It's right out of his playbook that he exercised at Ohio State. Larry Schultz. Um, it recently, in a poor neighborhood in Nigeria, a man was found dead in his apartment, and uh, the police found $45 billion uh, in his desk. And it uh, turned out that uh, nobody was answering his emails. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have time to go around the room, but that was worth it. I gotta, we are out all next week, and then I'm off the week after that. Have a great 4th of July. Stay happy and safe. Dave Ramsey shows next. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg, and TV 10. We'll talk to you again in several days. News on the hour, presented by Indeed.com. I'm Deborah Rodriguez. We are.